So rotor tilling. Rotor tilling. When we started farming, that was the only tool we had in our toolbox. That's the only tool I had to clean up the beds, to, you know, when there was like weeds that got infested, you know, what do I do? I till. And then I was thinking, you know, when you go with a, a BCS and you till, you get about 10 inch of really, really loose soil. And I would stick my whole hand into it. And I was like, wow, this is perfect. If I was a root, I'd be happy. I'd be shooting down. But what you're doing is that you're taking soil that has nice aggregates and you're putting it in a blender and you're pulverizing everything into finer particles. So the first week, it's great. Super deep, super loose. Come back the next one and it starts to compact. Because you need these aggregates. That's your soil structure. So if aggregates are your soil structure, rototillers are destroyers of soil structures. That's what they are, okay? And not to say that it's not a good thing or a bad tool, it's not like that. But on the long run, if you wanna have really deep, fertile, productive soil, it might be a suggestion to move away from that tool. Which is why we've adopted a harrow on the farm many years ago. And the harrow has tines on a vertical shank and it's, it does a horizontal mixing of the soil. It's not tilling it, you know, it's not turning it over, it's just mixing it like that. And you can really adjust it to work on one inch, one inch, one inch and a half. So shallow cultivation, deep aeration with the broad fork. So the two of them working together to get what you want. So these harrows, we knew about them. We had looked them up in Europe. We tried to buy one, perhaps for small tractors when we were in that. And it was crazy. You can get one from a walking tractor at, you know, a quarter of the price. They come with an adjustable roller in the back. And that roller in the back is an important piece of that tool because what it does, it does two things. You can adjust the height, which is really handy, and firms the beds and flattens them out. So at the end of the process, you have beds that are perfectly conditioned for either transplanting or direct seeding. If you haven't tried a harrow yet, I recommend it, okay? It's an amazing tool. There's one outside, you can check it out if you guys want. Okay, so, harrow, power harrow, BCS, wall contractors, and you can have different tools. Most people know this, but some don't. You know, these, these walk behind tractors, they're really versatile. You can change the equipment that goes in the back. They're in the, with quick attaches, you can do this really easy. You can adjust the wheel length, and you know, you can go crazy. You know, perhaps in a couple of years, in Asheville, downtown, people will be riding these. <laughs> riding them to market with melons in the back. A lot of uh, people that are from, you know, the pioneers of organic farming and gardening, they know these machines as rotor tillers, these old Troy built red machines, really rugged, really heavy duty, they still, they still run. But these, these machines don't have the capacity to turn the handlebars, which is really what makes this machine different. S and you can, ha you can change the equipment in the back. So wh what it is, it's, it's really a power unit for all different implements, like a tractor is, but tailor-made for permanent raised beds. Okay, these guys, I'm sure they had that in mind when they, they built these in the 1940s and 50s. It's gender friendly and everybody on the farm can use them. And that's important because a lot of the new growers or, you know, aspiring farmers, there's a lot of studies that are showing that like most than, more than 60 of, of, of 60% are females. So you need to have machines that you can actually physically be able to operate. Okay? Well, you can also... <laughs> 
That was one of my worker. He, you can also work your tan with the machine, which is not the case if you're sitting on a tractor. Not sure he knows he's on that slideshow, but that's another story. <laughs> okay, so this is another tool that made his way in our toolbox years ago, and it's called a rotary plow. So it takes, it scoops the dirt from the aisle and shoots it onto the beds. This kind of replaced the shovel to raise the beds every other year, because the beds, they tend to settle over time and that and we need to re-raise them and we used to do this with a shovel now we do this with that rotary plow so shaping beds not using any tractors but some people might notice that it's pretty clean and you know i don't i don't use herbicides that's for sure but that would be like a couple of passage of rotor tillers or a couple of passage of disking to get something like that and how do we get these beds to be so clean and the answer is here tarps many years ago I stumbled across that way of operating when I was in my hoop houses I had things growing and I knew I had a succession coming and I had covered one bed with with a, with a black tarp because I didn't want it, that bed to get infested with weeds while I was waiting to do my other succession. And what I observed was that, whoa, the crop that had been tarp had almost zero weed pressure, or at least a lot less than the other crop that hadn't been tarp. But it was really evident, obvious. And so I, research, I looked that up. This is called occultation. And what it is, is that underneath the tarp, it's dark, it's moist, and it's warmer so it's the perfect germinating condition so all the dormant weed seeds that are in your beds they germinate and then what happens they die because there's no light so the absence of light and the the proper germinating conditions really fend off the weeds in your garden and I thought whoa that's pretty cool so we bought some kick-ass tarps and we started to cover whole field blocks with these black tarps. And these are black UV treated silage tarps. Okay, they're not landscape fabric. It's not the same. Because landscape fabric breeds. It lets water in, lets water out. These plastic tarps, they're food grade, but they trap the humidity, which is what you want, because you need to have moisture at the, at the top. Okay, and so we, when we bought these big tarps, then you know one thing leading to the other, what we got was that, like we would remove these tarps, and all of this was was gone, disappeared, vanished. It was like, whoa, this is this is ready to go. I haven't plowed, I haven't disked, I haven't rotor till, I haven't done really nothing, and you know instead shaped the beds every other year. I covered them and then I'm ready to plant. And that was really the start of, of what I called minimal tillage practices for us. Not talking about a no-till because we're still tilling with the broad fork and we're shallow cultivating. But the tarps, man, they made it happen big time for us. And using not a lot of fossil fuel and getting it done. It's clean. Saving a lot of time that way. So that was a major cornerstone moment in our cropping system. Uh, that was in 2007, I think. So again, these tarps are not la landscape fabric, and there's a difference between both. How do you weed those down? Well, you see, because the beds are raised, there's like anchors, because water gets into them, and then they, they hold down. So you're going to bury the edges. And then if there's a rain, you're okay. If there's no rain, you can come and put sandbags every now and then. But they're quite heavy. And, and that's one of their drawbacks. Because this works really well. But, you know, when you want to move them, it's, some, you know, it's an event. And it stinks. And it's heavy. And so... You need a tractor. No, you don't need a tractor. 
No, because a tractor wouldn't do anything. What, what, what the solution we came up with was to buy more of them. So we didn't need to move them around all over the place. So the warmer the soil is, the more active your soil is. So the warmer it is, the faster this process goes. So I usually go from two to four weeks, depending on how warm it is, is the amount of time that is required to get that done. But then it's, you know, it's site specific and it uh, depends on, on the month you're in. So they're about 40 feet and we have two of them per field block. They're about $300, $400, so they're expensive. But I think they're de a definite worthwhile investment. So we're removing the tarps, and I give my employees espressos. <laughs> so again, these tarps, you know, there's something to handle, but man, they just done the job. <laughs> okay? So now with my, I'm, I'm getting the, the plow to reshape my beds. And what that tool does is that it just scoops the dirt from the aisle and shoots it onto the bed. And I'm not worried about the integrity of my soil in the aisles. Because I step on it and whatever. It's my bed. My bed I want to be really careful with. So when that's done, the next stage is the broad fork. And I tell you guys, after many years of taking care of your soil, it's really easy to go with a broad fork. It's just like... It's like butter. In many cases, I don't even need to do it. If my root systems aren't really shooting down, I can go by without doing it. Is that the only time you walk in your bed? Uh, yeah. And again, some people will broad fork, and then they're like, well, I don't like broad forking. It's too hard. It doesn't work. The broad fork doesn't work. And I'm like, no, no, no. If you're having a hard time broad forking, the problem is not the broad fork. The problem is your soil you should be like super happy that you're broad forking because you're trying to remedy the problem. Now what I'm doing is I'm putting vermicompost because I've stopped putting that compost because our organic matter content on the farm went to 3% to like 14%. So we have organic matter onto our beds and so by using vermicompost I'm just spreading less of them and it's giving just as much nutrient power as regular compost. I can talk more about that later on if you want. So the last step is the harrow and that's like the final stage of the bed prep. It levels and firms the bed and mixes the compost in the top inch. And that's that. Okay? So these are the procedures that we follow to have a minimal tillage practice on the farm. So that was for outside. Inside, we use this 15-inch cultivator. It's sold by Johnny's. It's, a, it's action by a drill. It's the same principle. Shallow cultivation for final seed bed preparation. So the same steps. But instead of having the, ra the harrow, which is, you know, doesn't work to get in, we use this cultivator. A rake will do the same thing, but we're all about speed and efficiency. And that tool really refines the top inch, which is what you want if you're going to be working with some of the cedars that we're using on the farm. I'll talk about cedars later on, but seed bed preparation is the solution to your cedar problems. <laughs>